so we are asked to give a breakdown of how this image was made you know, uh, people said it looks much realistic and what were the thoughts that goes into the process of creating it and we are going to be showing you there the first thing is modeling as we all know and let's see it was modeled in uh, Revit because Revit is quite simple to use and also um, this is this is actually a design that we did so we rely on Revit to do all our design because it's it's much more easier to quickly put a thought and sketch it and quickly uh, fire your software up and do something so that is why we rely on Revit. Revit is quite intuitive if you know the way everything works and really you can quickly get results out you know without stress and that's why we use it it's basic modeling as you can see walls and floors because we use floor for the roof because of the deck and you know ceiling window doors the major thing is how the elements are put together and you know that's designed for you so after that uh we put everything in place this railing was downloaded on a website maybe beam city or Revit city or something like that there are many of them out there we just search for an average railing and we saw that this one was okay so it was uh gotten and of course there is a road here eh? it's like we lost the main file so i just quickly reduced some part of this file to fit into what we have done before so there's a road that was actually modeled eh? let me see if it is still there it's not i can see it is not so after we are through with the modeling, uh, this was modeled in Revit 2018 and the challenge with that is that we are using 3ds Max 2017. We don't want to go into 2018 because, you know, for 3ds Max because of crash reports that we were seeing flying all around when we were making this image. So it makes it a little bit difficult for us to utilize the interoperability between Revit and 3ds Max uh, but yet it's still very very simple to export Revit to Max even though uh, your version of Revit might be higher so what you do if your version of Revit is higher than that of 3ds Max is just to come to file then export FBX and from FBX you can quickly gets into 3ds Max and starts working. So let's go to 3ds Max and see what we put together. So in 3ds Max, we imported, so if you want to import, you come to the import and you click on link FBX and you can only link FBX because it was, you know, it was designed in a way that when you link it, of course you can still import FBX as well, but linking it make it easier, especially when you are working with on a design that can change. So let's say the client come back now and say, oh, I don't want this design here. I don't want this element, I don't want that. So you can easily go back to your Revit file and redesign or remodel that part. And then you come to references and you click on manage links. So it will show you the link here. You can see FBX, then you click on reload. So when you reload, uh, it gives you many options and with that options, there will be option to make sure that all your materials that you have in 3ds Max before is intact. So you are not changing those materials. So if you enable that, you will not need to start all over again to work. So that is just all about that. So now let's talk about uh, the framing. The framing is very, very simple. As you can see, we follow rule of thirds, you know, putting the building uh, in the thirds. And if I click here, for the cameras, sorry, select the camera. You see that camera, we have a 35 millimeter lens, and for the focal length, we use 30, and also the aperture, we use 16, and, and you know that is for the lighting anyway. The shutter speed 
120 and ISO is 100. Why did we do that? Because we are, we are shooting afternoon and if you notice this is the height of the sun, it's about 80 meters, you know, and it's, it's at least if you notice here, we will have like 10 of these buildings on top of each other, if not more, before we reach this height. So uh, it's quite high for that. And that's actually a sunny afternoon. So, and if you click, if, if, if you notice here uh, under the modify, the sun settings, there is no particular thing that we, we've done here. We just leave it as it is. So, nothing uh, really, really uh, serious about it. We just drag the sun up, and when it reaches where we feel like it's okay, of course, we are good. One of the things that we always rely on when we are doing our uh, lighting is this frame buffer. And now let me even try and quickly put some settings and let you see the way it works. So in the frame buffer, I always use this, you know, interactive rendering. So by doing interactive rendering, I'll see how the light um, interact with, you know, all the elements in the scene and it will be giving me a uh, real time feedback on what I'm doing. So it gives me all this. I, I quickly saw the way the shadows are going here, which is quite impressive. You can see how the shadow goes around there. So I, I know some people will say, ah, you know, put the tree so that the shadow will fall on the building. It's, it's good, it's good, but why can't you do it in a creative way? You can see the shadow is falling, but yet nothing too much. Because we have this shadow also here, which is quite impressive. As you can see now, this is the way the sun is. Everything is okay, cool. Then we started adding the elements that we're supposed to add. One of the things about afternoon rendering is that if I click on this camera again, because there's something very, very important to talk about, which is the white balance. You can see it is on daylight. 6500 Kelvin, which is you know, like a normal white balance for a daylight. Now, one of the things that also we put into consideration are this shadow. You can see the way the shadow goes. So it shaded some parts and revealed some parts. In the afternoon rendering, one of the things that I noticed personally is that everything is actually uh, well exposed, you know, when you are using sunlight. So you don't need to be too hard on lighting and just play with the shadow. The shadow give us some uh, interesting angle here, which forms another shape you, you get. And everything still look really, really cool, which is one of the things I personally uh, prefer. So now, after we've done this, um, the this camera setting is actually uh, called uh, Sony 16 rule. So I open it. Wikipedia, you know, just search for Sunny 16 rule. In photography, the Sunny 16 rule, also known as F16 rule, is a method of estimating correct daylight exposure without using a light meter. So, light meter is good for what it is, but yet, using Sunny 16 rule, applying it still makes sense. And if you notice here on a sunny day with ISO 100, which we already have, films, ISO 100 film setting in the camera. Once set the aperture to f16, then shutter speed to maybe uh, 100 fraction of a second or 125 fraction of a second or anything in between. So I personally use 120, you know, and that is how uh, this was gotten. Very, very simple and, you know, nothing should be much, nothing should give you a day. So after that, the next thing to do is to start adding elements and one of the things that I personally have uh, discovered is in a real life situation, when you want to snap, you know, a building like an architectural photographer would do, there are a lot of buildings in the environment. So these buildings affect the way the sun interacts with your own building. Because if you have a tall building, you know, at the side of your building, if you cast shadow or you wait till the sun moves that push that shadow away. So all those things, bearing all those things in mind, then I started looking at what to do. And if I hide all the other elements now, 
so I'll know on the high the forest park layer. You'll see there are some buildings around and they are taken from the sunlight. Of course, I have some trees as well around. Oh, this is between uh, interactive rendering for button. I suppose I've stopped that. So let it just work a little bit. So you can see the way it looks. So by putting all these elements in place, of course, I have many of these trees all around just to make sure that they take some part of the sunlight. So, you know, the sun will not be too hard. And also, if you notice here, yeah, this shadow that we have uh, is a long shadow. So, the long sh shadows are always soft because normally the best way to, uh, uh, the normal way to get soft shadow is to increase the sun disk, which is this. But in this, we didn't really increase any sun disk. We just make sure that the sun is long. So, it is giving us long shadow. And with long shadow, we have you know nice soft uh what's it called around there. Of course, it looks like it's no longer there <laughs> right now because you know, like I told you, some of the part of the file was lost. I just quickly put everything together. So many of the things you see right now, you might not see them the way uh they are, but actually we play with all that to give us something really, really nice and cool. So after that, now let's talk about materials. So what I'm going to do is to stop this. Before we talk about the materials, I need to quickly talk about this car. So the car is in motion. And I personally don't like to do motion blur in Photoshop. I just want to go to Photoshop, put some elements together under two, three, five minutes and through with my post processing and you know deliver the job. So this motion blur was done in 3ds Max and what was done was that oh it is in it is doing uh, auto save right now so let's wait so for the motion blur what was done was that I have this element here and now if I come to the track bar here if I move this you can see that it is moving so i just did a little animation there with uh auto keyframe and it gives me that so when i want to render i try to position it in such a way like this and if you check the camera under shutter speed i enabled a uh, motion blur you can see enabled motion blur so by enabling motion blur i got uh, this simple blur around here so let's look at materials. So for us to look at material, I will hide all those elements that I unhide again so that it will not be disturbing us. So for the materials, they are simple materials actually, you know, just uh, for the brick, you can see. A brick and bomb. That's all. There is nothing much more about it. I come here. You see some wall materials, some of these walls. So I put some reflection to them. And because uh, if you paint on a wall in Revit, and you know you paint on one object and the other object are that same object have another. Uh, paint or another material so it will make them multi-material and that is why we are having all these modes going into each of those slots so this uh material right here it is into slot two and into slot one here whereas this orange wall which is this is into slot one here and slot two here and you know the door just just some basic uh, material setting and you can even see for the window basic ones basic ones nothing too much so i can say the major thing here on the material is the is this you know pavement here interlocks here and the interlocks were made with a uh, flood generator as you can see 
with flow generator and if I come back here, pick this and pick the material, this is the material. So what you will notice is that I use multi-texture multi -texture to load many, material, many uh, texture, about five of them. So I loaded them. So those, those textures give me that even though we are not seeing it much here, but you can see how the patches of red, you know, on this. So I just, I always like to make that with um, plug generator because it is just all about just draw and quickly put it. So that, that's, that's just all about that for the, for the, Gravels here. Yeah. I use um, was it called forest park to quickly create the gravel? Very very simple also. Um, don't mind that it wants me to forest park want me to connect to my account with them. So, oh no no no! Don't tell me this right now. And by clicking on forest park, I slow things down a little bit. But that's how I did that also. You notice there is a grass behind. Let's just zoom and that grass as well was done with forest park. And that's just all it, you know, putting all these other elements like umbrellas because they will be sitting here and they will have some, they can play there, they can rest there. So if you are there in the afternoon, you have a chair or so, you have umbrella that will shade you from the sun and those are just the major things. So now, this is the final part. Of course, you see the road as well. The road is just some normal textures. If you notice, you will be the up on them. Then it is true. It's, it's cool. One of the things I did about the road was that I actually, you know, just laid it. I didn't even bother about uh, whether the uh, UV is right or not because if a close shot, I will only see a part, and that part will not, you know, reveal all those wala. So, uh, permit me for that word. If you are not in Nigeria, wala means all those stress. So, that is just all about that. And for the render setup, uh, one of the things that I personally take serious is the render setup. And yet, I don't want anything complicated. So. Bucket rendering minimum sub divs is one, maximum sub divs is 16, then noise threshold is 0 0.003. Then, uh, the color mapping is exponential. The major reason for exponential is because it dials down the overexposure on images. And so far, you have been after no rendering, everything we want to be overexposed. So, using exponential, we tone them down a little bit. Of course, the challenge with that is the color management now will look somehow because actually that is what color mapping is doing so the color might not come out well and that's actually the reason for post-production so after that the gi radiance mapping high settings and one of the things i always do as well is to bump all these sub divs up a little bit because i think i don't think it's under that there by default I don't want to change anything. Okay, I'll change it to that, but let me just show you this out. And the light touch is 1500. You know, under settings, I use 24B for the rendering. So everything, everything is okay. Everything if I come to export. Normally, when when this was done, because this is very next now, it was done on very 3.6. So there's an option here for um enable low thread priority but now it's no longer there so and i conserve the memory then as well so for the render elements even though all these render elements are here which is extra text very reflection refraction the truth is for this particular one i disabled all render elements so there is no render element i just finished the rendering and took it to photoshop 
Of course, when I finish the rendering, let's say uh, we'll just use this as an example. Let's say we, you, you are through with this. So, of course, you see all these render elements here, but I didn't use any of them for the final image. So, I just click on save and I chose TIFF here. So, TIFF helped me to retain all my uh, pixel information. And now, let's go to Photoshop. So here we are in Photoshop and you can see uh, this is the image, everything the way uh, it is right now. So I'm going to quickly show you what was done to actually bring the image out. So now what was rendered is this. This is what was rendered and you can see it's a little bit dull now one of the things i like to do as well is to make sure that the exposure is not as bright as possible you know it's not too bright when i'm coming from 3ds max so i can come here and still work on the exposure a little bit if i feel the need to but if the exposure is too bright over there by the time you bring it into photoshop you will just be dealing with you know too bright too much pixels that are bright so and i like the shadows that are here the first thing i did was to click on that layer you can see just single layer and i came to filter uh this nick collection is actually useful and it's free you know from google of course now google have sold it to uh, dxo and they're selling it now but you can still browse around on the internet and you will find the free one the free google one so definitely it will be a little bit old but yet you'll see it and i chose color effects pro and under color you can see it's showing me that there is an update but i will not click the update because i don't want to pay for it when the free one is serving me well i don't need to get the uh, new one and you can see uh, I used, I came to, because if you are using it for the first time, this is what you are going to see. So I click on architecture so that it will streamline it to what I can use for architecture photography. And I click on pro contrast. And for the pro contrast, the first thing I did was to correct the color cast. Now, if you are new to it, it will look like this. And here you can split the image preview. So I remove the color cast. And if you notice what has happened is there is a blue. That was casted on this image but it has been reduced if you notice quite very well you see look at that wall you see around there so this one is much more uh warmer than this so the next thing to do is to correct the color contrast you can see so it's, it's quite simple and easy and you see just dialing everything the way you feel like is okay and it's even me some nice image already which is quite simple and okay so i can click okay for it even though i already have uh, the one that i use for the project but just for you to see the way it is and you can see the difference quite interesting and really i can leave it like this and give the client and the client will still appreciate it so i can just tend to delete that one and enable the one that i used for the image you can see this one is not as bright as that other one but i was okay with it the next thing was that i extracted some details out now to extract the details out of course i copy this you know by using ctrl j into two places and on the ctrl j you see the first one i group both of them you can see this group look at here you can see if i I love the group that's why i'm saying this to you so on the first one it is on the layer of vivid light and the group itself is on overlay so on the overlay and you know i click back on the one that has the vivid light and i press ctrl high to invert it then after i inverted it i click on filter and i use blur and i use surface blur to bring out details then i apply a layer mask 
to it a black layer mask to paint the areas i want the details so if i off it now and i hone it you will see the areas where the details is missing look at all around there these are details to extract the concrete texture the uh, brick becomes much more better detailed and also the walls that have concrete textures on them then after that is this um layer and you see this layer is very very simple what i did here was i duplicated everything by pressing control alt shift and e and it gave me this layer and i put it on screen mode and i just reduced the opacity so it gives me a brighter image you can see then after that i have this as well on a normal mode what did i do i'm trying to remember what i did here that's actually okay what happened is i think the image was having a challenge somewhere and i had to mask some area house you know i can't remember this anyway but the next thing was to apply curve and now in the curve what i did was oh this is too cold it's, it's looking too blue and it's afternoon so i want to make it a little bit warm so on the curve i created the curve and i came to blue and i dial the blue down a little bit you can see it. So i drag it up so i just dial it a little bit down so it removes some blues from it and now i created another group and i use uh in this group now it's the sky and how did i get the sky you know to fit into this area when i was saving i saved the layer mask let me quickly go to the death mask to show you what layer mask is um you can see here you see the layer map sorry the alpha channel so this alpha channel is very very useful so i just save the alpha channel as well and in photoshop i come here create a new folder and under the folder i put two skies so two skies so let me just off every other layers so that you will see the skies and uh, let me let me disable okay so now let me just this is sky so this sky you can see i reduce the opacity so let me increase it so 100 percent then you can see the way it looks so i applied a layer mask to just remove some parts that i don't want so if i press shift again this is actually the image a layer mask to just remove some parts that i don't think i want and that's how we have this but I reduce the opacity to like 54% so that it's not that strong. Then I placed this other uh, layer as well, another sky. So this other sky, I didn't put any layer mask on that because I don't want to remove anything. So I put it also on 78% opacity. So they are mixing together in a group. So what I, the major reason I did that was because I still want that background that came from 3ds max to still be relevant so i just used the two and i discovered that their exposure and their white balance is a little bit strong so i applied a curve layer to tone everything down and i also apply color balance to just make sure that i get what i want and now applying everything so the layer mask was used let me show you. Uh, sorry, the alpha channel rather. I'm so I don't know why I'm using the hands. So now this is it. You can see everything is black and white. And all I just need to do is to come to select and click color range. And now I pick the sky. You can see the sky is white. So I click OK. Not 
by by doing that it will do automatic selection for me and now i can off that one you can see that the selection is on and while the selection is on after i put all these into let, let, let's just even do it let's remove this layer mask delete so this is the way everything is right now so i have this selection i'll just click on layer mask and it will mask out all the areas that is black in the selection that i made the other time so it gives me only the sky and i'm cool with that and i can move the sky all around to stretch it you know till it fits into what i want then i apply another curve just to bump everything up to align the layers to the objects to themselves and give some contrast you can see now everything is becoming sharper and i put another <laughs> curve you know just to bump the exposure up a little bit and that's why i said you should always reduce your exposure you know in 3ds max since you can try and manipulate some things in uh, photoshop then that is all that is actually all about the editing but i felt this is nice but it's too plain there are some dust in the atmosphere that we always have so i created a new layer so i can delete this layer and it will show you how to do it so i created a new layer pick my brush tool by pressing b on the keyboard then I try to come to some sort of orange, orange color, something close to orange like this. I pick this color or something like that for the afternoon and work on the size of your brush. So I started painting on this layer. You can see. You don't have to to be too uh, careful about it. You just have to create something. So after I created it, I put it on screen. I can see. Then I reduce it a little bit. Maybe to like sixty something, uh, twenty something percent. And if I off and on it, see. But I still feel like ah, this is too much. So I apply a layer mask, change the brush to black. Uh, I started, you know, painting some areas out that I don't want to be touched. You can see. So now, one of the things I like about this is that. If you notice these green plants here and this green plants, the tree here, they don't have the same green, the same level of green. This one have some yellow into it. And you can see this tree as well. So because in real life, all the trees will not be green. We totally mean their green will have hues. So you need to just work on that as well. And you can see everything just look uh, nice. And if I up and on it, you can see they are there, but they are not really, really uh, that visible until when I up and on it. One of the things I want you to take from post production is when you are doing post production and everything is too obvious, then your post production is not right. Let it be that until when you up and on your layer like this. It will not be noticeable that you have done anything until when you're up and on and you can see the difference so that's just all about it let me have your comments and also let me know if this is useful of course it's extensive maybe about 35 or 40 minutes i guess you can see 35 minutes but i hope it is helpful and i'm glad that i'm able to make this so let me have your opinion let me have your um, questions and in the next tutorial I will try as much as possible to answer. Thank you.